Hello, welcome to Star Cells and God. We're here to, discu to discuss discoveries taking place at the frontiers of science, discoveries that have theological and philosophical implications, as well as discoveries that point to the reality of God's existence. I'm Jeff Zwerink, joined with Dr. Eric Hadeen. But before we get into the topics of discussion, I wanted to encourage you to subscribe to our channel, Reasons to Believe, and click on the bell icon so you can be informed of our new videos. Learn more at reasons.org or by following us on social media at rtb underscore official. Eric, good to have you here today. Thank you so much, Jeff. I know so. you've been here on a past show. I wonder, you might just kind of give a little bit of background of who you are so that we know uh, just a little bit about you before we get into the discussion today. All right. Well, uh, my background is as a physicist. I've uh, done research in, in experimental plasma physics and uh, integrated optics. And then um, I taught physics at uh, couple of different universities, Taylor mm -hmm. University in Indiana, Ball State University uh, for 15 years in Indiana. And um, there I did, again, research, but in a different field of computational nanoelectronics. Oh, wow. And uh, then I finished kind of my academic career with um, a short time at Biola University here in Southern California. Oh, very good. You had pretty pretty decent spectrum of where you're doing there. So, yes. well, again, I'm excited about having you on the show. I know we're going to be talking about information and living systems and non-living systems. So, mm -hmm. why don't I? I'm just going to turn the floor over to you and uh, kind of lead us through our discussion this morning. Okay. So, I appreciate the opportunity to share about this because I believe that this topic really is particularly relevant and important for the discussion of, is there evidence for God as a creator within this natural universe? Mm. And uh, so the topic of information theory um, can get fairly technical and mathematical, and I'm going to try to just keep it more um, general today and conceptual. But um, thinking about living systems, we know that they are particularly described by high levels of what we might call specified complexity. Mm. Uh, and that's necessary for them to actually function um, at the cellular level. And so what we can do then is ask, can natural processes, things that are governed by the laws of physics, you know, I'm a physicist and I know what the laws of nature are and what's available from nature's side, can nature then be expected to generate the molecular complexity that's found within all living systems. Mm -hmm. And so as we go forward here in our discussion, I hope to provide some uh, rationale that would suggest that no nature is not able to actually accomplish what we see within mm. every living system, even the very simplest uh, single-celled organisms. All right, so why don't we get into that? Uh, yeah, I know you mentioned just a second ago specified complexity, that that's the sort of thing that he... Give us a little primer on what that is just so that we know what we're talking about as we go through our discussion yes, today. Yes, and I think it's important for um, us to understand that when we talk about the complexity found within living systems, it's different than what might be called an ordered system. Um, in fact, nature can produce ordered systems. It's, it's very good at that. Um, and that would be any sort of um, kind of like a, a crystalline structure, for example, might even be uh, as a snowflake. And it's simply taking on the typical structure based on the way the water molecules in the uh, solid state form bonds with each other. And it then produces the, the typical six-sided snowflake pattern. It really just follows the laws of physics. But living systems are not ordered in that way. And then kind of an opposite effect that nature is also good at, uh, we'll kind of get rid of the, the things that nature can do first and then talk about what it can't do. But mm -hmm. um, the opposite to the ordered system is a random but complex system that might be um, typified by just a, a cloud. Mm. And, uh, you know, a cloud is also water droplets, um, but the position of the droplets is completely random and there's no particular structure to it. And if you were to try to, say, come up with a, a spreadsheet that gave the position, the, the velocity, 
direction and magnitude of each water molecule in the cloud, it would be completely difficult. It would be mm -hmm. so complex. But the thing is, ordered systems and these random complex systems both fail to describe what we have in, in life. Um, living systems are complex, but not random. Hmm. And living systems are not ordered like a snowflake. They're, they're complex, but specific. And, and just to give a, an example from a different um, kind of a setting than living systems, something people can relate to, uh, think of the letters that make up the words in a, in a book. And if you just looked at the arrangement of the letters, there's not a repetitious pattern to those. It's mm -hmm. not like you've got A, B, C, D repeated uh, a thousand times and that makes up the story. Right. Um, there would be no information in that. But neither are the sequence of letters randomized. Um, which would, the mm -hmm. random arrangement of letters would be like the cloud, the repetitious uh, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, that would be like the snowflake. So what is it? Well, there's a complexity. If you look at the letters in the, let's say, the first page of a book, you will not find any pattern that suggests uh, a repetition or uh, order. But what you will find is a, a complex, uh, meaningful message that's based on the arrangement of the letters. And it, it can only be defined as something that is produced by an intelligent mind. There's, there's no right. aspect of nature, no law of gravity or electromagnetic interaction or any principle of nature that can produce that kind of... Um, complex but specific ordering. So the specific ordering of letters mm -hmm. is, of course, something that we recognize as humans as a, a meaningful arrangement corresponding to the language that we know. It's interesting. You know, I was just sitting there thinking about, okay, so what, you know, if you were to analyze the letters on a page, I'm sure, you know, you'll sit there and you'll find that there are certain letters that have a greater uh, frequency than other letters. You're going to sure. find more E's and T's and S's than you will X's, E's and Q's. Yes. Um, you're right. There's no repetition because that would almost – that almost makes it devoid of information, if you will. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. Whereas if it's just random, you know, either one of those kind of remove the information. But it seems almost intrinsically to talk about information in the letters – there's got to be something that processes the information, if you will. Yes, yes. And it, it has to be an, an intelligent mind um, and a mind that even can, you know, to properly interpret the information there, it has to be a mind that is familiar with the language. Mm -hmm. Like if um, you had letters, but it was in a language that is unfamiliar to you or me, then we might believe that there's meaningful information there, but we wouldn't be able to interpret it easily. Okay. Now, there are, you know, are specialists in fields like cryptography that deal with just that problem right. of, of seeing what looks like maybe a meaningful sequence of symbols, but it's unfamiliar, but there are ways to actually uh, sort out what the message is and to kind right. of break the code. Um, now, I think that if we go back to the question of how can we maybe decide whether or not natural forces can produce this complex specified pattern, not to write a, a book, mm -hmm. but to produce the uh, biolecular machinery that makes up uh, a single cell. Mm -hmm. And again, it's it's not ordered, it's not random, it's arranged in a specific way that allows for uh, the functioning of the cell. Uh, the cell is filled with the molecular machines. They, it's like a metropolis, mm -hmm. and uh, it's so much more than just something that is uh, like a, a blob of uh, jello surrounded by a membrane mm -hmm. on the interior of the cell. So, so why can't nature do that? And one thing that I always like to say is that anytime you try to put together something that's complex, functional, specific, and meaningful, 
there are always more ways to go wrong than to go right. Yes. Uh, if you just had a pile of um, uh, amino acids, you know, keeping it within the context of uh, uh, biochemistry here, just if you have a, a pile of amino acids, that, let's say even the ones that are always found within living systems, and you wanted to build a protein, which is essentially made up of a long string of amino acids um, bonded together, you would imagine nature just putting them together in by selecting them randomly. Mm -hmm. Well, how many ways are there to go right, meaning to end up with a functional uh, protein in the end, mm -hmm. versus going wrong, where you don't get a functional protein. And um, this has been actually studied by biochemists. And the answer is that even for just a moderate protein, it's about one chance out of 10 to the 77th in terms mm -hmm. of there's maybe one chance of getting it all correct, the correct sequence that produces the functional uh, protein versus how many ways to go wrong. You know, right. 10 to the 77th, that's almost, I mean, that's a huge number, almost as large as the total number of particles in the universe. Right. And uh, so there's just no way to appeal to luck at this point, which I know sometimes uh, people who don't want to allow God into the discussion might uh, say, well, okay, so it's improbable, but improbable things happen now and then. And, uh, <laughs> and this, you know, arrangement of amino acids that led to uh, functional proteins, that was just one of those lucky things that uh, came about. But it's beyond what we can expect nature to produce by any sort of a coincidental arrangement. No, that's, uh, you know, I appreciate that. And that's one of the, honestly, one of the things that just kind of struck me in my, as I got into apologetics was just recognizing the improbability of a lot of things. You know, I do know as a as a physicist, and I'm sure you you deal with this as well. When you when you run into this, it's like, okay, this is what our understanding of physics says, and this is what we see working. And when there's this huge gap, you know, you see numbers like ten to the twenty, you know, ten to the seventy or something like that. Generally, that's a sign that we're missing something. So, my, I mean, if if we're just saying, all right, these all just kind of go together randomly, we've got a problem. Might there be? some sort of physical mechanism that's driving the assembly in a way that results in some more useful information. Uh, you know, like, I, I know the snowflake is not a great example because it's ordered, but not, but that's not random, if you will, because snowflakes couldn't just have any configuration. The physics right. kind of dictates what can happen, if you will. Might the chemistry right. be dictating what could happen? Well, that's, that's a reasonable thought, um, you know, in terms of trying to understand if there might be a naturalistic explanation. Uh, but let's let's just run with that and suppose that um, the chemical bonds that, um, you know, we'll just start with amino acids, say we've got all of those, because um, nature can produce amino acids on its own. And, and the reason is that um, they're just not that uh, complex. They're not composed of you know, that many atoms, maybe 20, 25 atoms, something like that. Um, so let's start with those. And then let's imagine that nature had a preference for bonding um, certain amino acids together, uh -huh. a preference that kind of in a way naturally selected which amino acids would bond next in the sequence of amino acids that makes up the protein. Uh -huh. And um, so if that were the case, then that's what would happen. And that's all that would happen. Okay. You would, you would get an extremely limited outcome if there was a natural law that dictated that this outcome is going to happen. Now, there's not just one protein in living systems. Right. Uh, it's estimated that within the human body, there may be as many as 80,000 different proteins. You know, some people estimate a little more, a little less, but right. not just 80,000 proteins, but that tens of thousands of different proteins 
that have different functions. Mm -hmm. And if nature had a preference for putting amino acids together that built just one type of protein, that's all we would have. And of course, with one type of protein, you wouldn't have life. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes far more than that. And so you cannot say that nature selects based on, say, uh, molecular attractions, uh, trying to put together the correct amino acids mm -hmm. to reach a lower energy state. And because if you did, that's, that's what you'd get. And that's all that you would get. It would right, be like no. having one <clears throat> uh, paragraph and that's the only paragraph that's ever written. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's nothing compared to the, uh, say, information within a whole library of books. Mm -hmm. And uh, living systems are more like a library of books rather than just one yeah. paragraph. No, and, and I think what I, my, my thinking there, and I was just kind of brainstorming, what, what would I, how would I think about that is, okay, yes, you've got this long string that goes, you know, to get the correct protein, you need to have the amino acids lined up in a certain sequence. Mm -hmm. um, the reality of this, this is, these are fairly complex chemical molecules. I mean, you know, the amino acids are relatively simple, but the more you put together, they become more complex. Yeah. That complexity now begins to interact with the environment. And so you have now this coupling between, okay, no, there isn't a certain chemical bonding that only this sort of chain is formed, but now these sorts of chains, they fold and they behave different ways. And so that interaction with the environment now gives more flexibility or more diversity of what could come. And so in that sense, there are certain things that play around in the environment longer or these sorts of structures stick around and might those structures that stick around correspond to what life requires. Well, yeah. Now, so so again, let's let's take that consideration or option. Um, you know, again, giving nature the benefit of the doubt as to maybe being able to move forward towards building what's necessary for life. And so, if a given protein or sequence of amino acids is interacting with the environment, you're back to um, relying on luck. Okay. Um, because anytime you have a, a, a system, just to generally describe something, that is allowed to naturally interact with its surroundings, its environment, you always lose information. This is actually a good kind of a segue. It's a, it's a big way to describe uh, the laws of physics that describe what information and natural processes do. Mm -hmm. And natural processes always destroy information with the passage of time. And this is a result that's actually based in, um, in physics. Uh, it's, it's not the simple second law of thermodynamics. It, it seems related to that. It is, it is certainly related to that, but it is more of a general... Um, version of it, you might say, that is based in the principles of quantum mechanics and mm. statistical physics. And um, so if you think of in quantum mechanics, we'll just diverge <laughs> a little bit into right. <laughs> some physics here, but in quantum mechanics, any system can be described by its wave function. And that's a quantum mechanical uh, phenomenon it's possible to typically write it uh, down as a mathematical expression, this wave function. But the important thing about a wave function, if, even if it's a wave function of just a single particle or a molecule or, or something more complex, is that the wave function contains all the information mm -hmm. that it's possible for an observer to know about the system. Okay. And what happens is that Unless that system is 100% isolated from its surroundings, mm -hmm. natural interactions between the system and the surroundings will lead to an uncontrollable and irreversible loss of information from the system into the environment. And in mm. quantum mechanics, in the field of, say, 
quantum um, computing. Uh, those who are trying to develop quantum computers are always struggling against this process, mm -hmm. and it's called decoherence. Right. Uh, the wave function begins to uh, kind of mix hmm. and spread into the environment, and that leads to a loss of information. So and, it sounds almost kind of like, uh, you know, uh, Similar to a thermalization process, you can have yes. a hot body mm -hmm. that remains hot, but the moment it starts to connect to the environment, the environment is always going to be cooler, and the information or the heat is going to flow to the environment, not the other way around. It yes. sounds akin to that, exactly. And I'm sure you know that you're you're describing the classical second law of thermodynamics by by what you just said. Right. This, this sort of a just the normal process that a cup cup of hot coffee on the table loses heat to the surrounding air, and ne it never goes the other way around. And and that's... Um, or it's so incredibly rare that we just don't worry about it. Well, incredibly rare, but it, it just... It, it won't happen. Exactly, right. It, yeah. it just... Uh, it's not even that we can open up a window for uh, a very rare event that a cup of cold water on the table will begin to boil because the heat from the environment is suddenly and really in an unusual way being directed into it. That doesn't violate the first law of thermodynamics having to do with energy transfer, yeah. but it completely violates the second law of thermodynamics and it will never happen. No, and, and that's, I guess, you know, that's part of the, as, phys as a physicist, I know incredibly rare means like one part in 10 to the who knows what number. It's this incredibly large number that I can't say it's zero, but for all intents and purposes, it just never happens. Well, yeah, so. and I, I like to actually claim that it's zero. And the, re okay. the reason is that we do not live in an infinite universe where we have infinite possibilities. Okay. We, we actually, I mean, the reality is that we live in a finite space-time uh, environment, hmm. meaning there's only so much time, mm -hmm. there's only so many seconds that have uh, transpired since the beginning of this universe and the, the size of this universe out to the cosmic horizon is only so many light years. Right. It, it's, there's just not an infinite space and there's not an infinite amount of time. And so when the probabilities are smaller than what uh, has been termed the probabilistic resources mm -hmm. of the universe, then we can legitimately claim that it has a zero chance of, of happening in this universe. Okay, so, so that's kind of the idea. Yes, you can calculate a probability. And let's say there's 10 to the 100 options or 10 to the 100 samples that you could do. If your mm -hmm. probability is smaller than 10 to 100, you can effectively say it's not going to happen because there isn't enough sample size to make that a reasonable option. Is, is that effectively yes, and, what you're and saying? Yes, actually, I think the, the absolute limit is, uh, I don't remember the exact number, but I believe it's closer to 10 to 140th. But right. anything that's less uh, probable than that uh, is just off the table, and you can legitimately claim that it has a zero chance of happening in this, in this universe. You know, it's... Um, you know, maybe if you mm -hmm. had an infinite universe that had existed for an infinite amount of time, there would be, uh, it would be possible to have more unlikely events happening. But we've we've got limits. Yeah. Here. No. So okay. So we're in the confines of our universe. Yes. The, you know, we, we could talk about fine tuning in terms of what all needed to happen. But given that there's only so many protons, so much, so much space, so much time, mm -hmm. there's a limit to how many how many things could happen. And what we're talking about here is beyond that probability. So effectively we say natural processes can't do that right. in our universe. Right, right. The, uh, the probability of uh, obtaining even a, a single cell, you know, just the simplest type of organism mm -hmm. uh, is, is such a low probability that were you to somehow gather all of the probabilistic resources of the universe and focus it on trying to make that single cell, you wouldn't even come close mm -hmm. to uh, allowing it to happen by natural processes. So, so what I might want to shift to is to ask, well, then how can complex, meaningful, functional things happen? Mm -hmm. 
And we don't even need to limit the discussion to uh, the origin of life, which is you know, nothing that any of us can bring about, even, even the most advanced um, uh, bio-research labs cannot bring about the origin of life, uh, even as they try to do it with teams mm -hmm. of scientists. But, but we right. can make things as, as complicated as, uh, you know, a laptop computer. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, how did, how did that happen? Well, humans used not just luck and, you know, they didn't just put the uh, raw ingredients of a laptop in a, in a room and, and kind of allow natural processes to assemble. There was a intelligence involved mm -hmm. in making choices as to what pieces were put together in what way in order to bring about, of course, right. the desired outcome. Mm -hmm. So how, does, how do we get away with that where uh, natural processes couldn't? Like, I don't think I've ever met anybody that believes that, that nature could produce uh, a laptop computer uh, that functions uh, on its own. With right. That. And um, so, so what's the difference? And I, of course, I believe that it's our, our minds. Mm -hmm. Now, sort of, sort of see if you can follow with me here the argument. If the materialist viewpoint is true, uh, by that I mean uh, someone who believes there's nothing in the universe except matter and energy and um, basically the laws of physics. Mm -hmm. And they might believe that uh, unguided processes through evolution led to the arrival of humans on, on the scene. And then humans are now somehow by more evolutionary processes intelligent and so now we're making mm -hmm. laptops and everything else in our technological society. So that person is faced with basically forced to believe that this universe given enough time will produce laptop computers mm -hmm. kind of by means of the intermediate step of producing humans. Oh, okay, yeah. So because it produced humans that can produce laptops, effectively we're an accident or a, a, a lucky chance. The fact that we are the lucky chance that can produce laptops essentially means the, the, the universe is producing laptops by chance. Right. So if you kind of fly back in time to sometime uh, after the Big Bang but before uh, planets had, had even formed, mm -hmm. you've got a universe just filled with um, – simple uh, ions of hydrogen and helium, and eventually you get atoms of those. Mm -hmm. And um, so again, a materialist would have to believe that that universe, which is our universe a long mm -hmm. time ago, in just a few billion years, will be producing laptops and microwave mm -hmm. ovens and cell phones and automobiles and and metropolises mm -hmm. and, and Lego uh, dragons, you know, <laughs> right. <laughs> on its own. And, you know, we can just look at the beginning, random atoms uh, shortly after the Big Bang and what we have now, everything I've just described. And the materialist has to really come forth and say, yeah, the laws of physics inevitably brought about all of this modern technology mm -hmm. And yet as a physicist, I would have to say that that just doesn't sound believable. Right. Um, and there well, are reasons for that. Yeah. Let me, let me ask a question because there's, uh, you know, we have these information systems, complex molecules inside life. And... Using natural processes, we can figure out how they work. We can figure out why they replicate. I mean, yeah, there, there's not. It's not like we have this complete understanding of life, but it doesn't mm -hmm. seem like there's anything unphysical going on there. No. So, right. it, there's part of me that's a very sympathetic to. It's like you know, we see physically that life just happens physically. Why would we expect it to be something other than the physics that that causes life in the first place? Well, and I agree with you 100 percent that. Uh, Within uh, any sort of a living organism, um, that I don't believe that there's violations of the laws of physics 
mm-hmm. going on at um, you know our cellular level that um, is responsible for us being physically alive. I, I agree with what you said that uh, the laws of physics are fully being satisfied, in, including laws of thermodynamics and so right. on, uh, in the activities within our cells, the metabolism and uh, the energy harvesting and all of that. Um, but the real question is, how did the mechanism get there in the first place? And uh, you say, well, you know, we were born. We were all born, right? Well, so in biology, if you look at science, science reaches conclusions based on observations of mm-hmm. nature. You know, you drop a rock enough times, you, you begin to understand, okay, there's something like the law of gravity. So you observe nature and see how it works. Um, you can have charge uh, particles and observe either attractions or repulsions, and you, you begin to measure the effect and come up with Coulomb's law for describing the force of those interactions right. based on observations. So what do we observe with regard to living systems and the very origin of living systems? Well, the only thing we've ever observed is that every cell always comes from a pre-existing cell. Okay, and and that's kind of a maxim uh, of you know it's a a law within biology. Mm-hmm. There there's never been any observation any different, and so I think that it's valid to suggest that well that's that's what's required is a pre-existing cell. So there's nothing within our observations of nature that suggests that there even um, should be a way to go from non-living hmm. things to living things because we've we've never observed that and as scientists the conclusions of science are based on what we observe and okay. no one has ever observed that so anybody that suggests that life can arise from non-life is not basing their conclusion upon science which is based on observations of nature okay. but they're basing their conclusion upon uh, some presupposition, uh, some hmm. worldview, or some maybe even uh, a quasi-religious belief. They're certainly not basing it upon a scientific conclusion. That's an interesting point. And, you know, I, I, I'm curious your thoughts. I'll throw out an idea here is that there's often this idea that, okay, you know, we'll stick with the origin of life here that, okay, we, as scientists, we only have natural processes. And so we have to stick within natural processes. I agree that that is by far the best way to determine what happens. Cause that's the history has shown as we look for natural processes, we found explanations sure. for things. Yeah. As we're looking at that, what you're saying is that cells come from cells. And so now we're going back and asking the question, how did the first cell come? We don't have any science or observation of that, if you will. Mm-hmm. All the data seems to point to there needing to be previous cells. So now we've got a worldview or a philosophical assertion that we're making. Either this came just from physical processes. This came because God created it. You know, whatever. Those are all mm-hmm. not scientific statements. They're philosophical assertions. Right that are not the science, but now we can investigate if that assertion is correct, what scientific consequences could would have. Yes. So it's not like the philosophies, in some sense, we're kind of, by saying it's all physics or all materialism, we're smuggling a worldview into the science. Mm -hmm. And we're missing that the whole point is how do we test the science of, or the scientific consequences of the philosophical Right. In a way, statement. how do we sort out which worldview is correct? And you mentioned yeah. either a naturalistic processes that led to the first uh, cell, or perhaps God created it. Mm-hmm. And, and is there any way in which we can sort that out besides just having an argument? <laughs> 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 and um, that, that never really leads to good conclusions. But I believe that there is. And I, again... As a physicist, I would say that understanding how nature works can allow us to draw conclusions uh, of what nature can do. So yeah. here the, the question is, can nature produce cells? And so we need to understand 
how nature works. Mm -hmm. And um, as we've already talked about, in, in nature, there is a general tendency for um, randomization, uh, for mm -hmm. things to, to mix. And information, which is, it, it's possible to ascribe a high value of information to the uh, particular specific complex structures within a, in a cell. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we know, information, it might be an immaterial thing, um, but it's always expressed in one way or another within uh, physical arrangements, like the letters on a page. Right, or, yeah. or a biochemist would recognize information in the sequence of nucleotides within a, a DNA molecule. Mm -hmm. Right. So those are physical things that uh, give us meaningful information. But physical things always obey the laws of physics. And the laws of nature, as we've already talked about, um, will guarantee that on average, things will mix over time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and complex things will lose information over right. time. Um, and, and this is just unavoidable. Uh, it never goes the other way around, and the, and the fundamental basis for it is that there's always more ways to go wrong than, mm -hmm. than to go right. And, and so for me, that is particularly relevant for answering this question of which worldview is, is the correct one for determining this uh, answer to a question that nobody has actually seen uh, non-living materials rearrange themselves into uh, a cell. Mm -hmm. But we obviously have cells, and uh, it was obvious that at some point in the universe there were no cells, so somehow it happened, and it's either nature or it's God. And yeah. I, But I think that uh, this discussion of what nature does to information and in complex systems, namely it degrades information, it um, uh, tends to break down complexity, uh, because there's more ways to break down a complex system than there are to enhance it. Mm -hmm. And so let's say you're only halfway there towards the functioning of a cell. Well, to complete the process, to get from halfway like a half-built cell to a fully mm -hmm. functional cell, you would have to do many other kind of adjustments that are specific, that are the right choice, the right step. Right. And compared to how you could go right with increasing the complexity towards a fully functioning cell, there are so many more ways to go wrong. Mm -hmm. And because it's not a single step but a multi-step sequence to arrive at the end goal. Um, anytime if you suggest that it's it just is one lucky step after another, you know, any that that's showing that the game is rigged somehow. Gotcha. And yeah. uh, that would um, that's just we already know that that's uh, not going to happen. We we have studied nature, we know that it degrades complex systems with time. And so that's the way it's going to work, and uh, it kind of rules out any naturalistic origin of life. So I'm going to I'm going to throw one question that a uh, a friendly colleague posed to me that I, I'm curious how you would respond, and then I'll let you wrap up with, or throw in a final couple of comments before I wrap up. But, so yeah, you know, as you mentioned, we have cells now, and there was some point in time in the universe where there wasn't cells. Mm -hmm. So if we yeah, I would say God because I think God did it. You know, if, if God says, okay, let's go look and see, let's go look at what happened when life started. Okay. What do you think we would find there? Would we find just boom, it's there? Would we find natural processes at work? Would we find what, – what do you think that would look like? Well, that's, that's a deep question. <laughs> um, kind of um, – you know, maybe we could frame it this way. How does it look when when God intervenes in in nature, mm -hmm. in, in this case particularly in creating the first life? Um, and I, I don't think that it would look anything different than what we might expect if we 
did it ourselves. Okay. Uh, there would be a movement of raw materials together uh, and being connected in the completely correct, complex, specified manner that results in uh, you know functional cells and then mm -hmm. eventually a whole uh, multicellular organism and a, and a being like uh, mm -hmm. like Adam. Okay. Um, and um, so it would it would look like you know a miracle. <laughs> um, how long did it take? I don't know. I mean, God could have done it in an instant. Or he may have taken uh, an hour. I have no idea. And that's, <laughs> right. that's kind of an irrelevant question in my mind, but it's uh, fascinating to think about. Right. Um, but, but here's the thing. In, in general, you know, even kind of taking it back to what we discussed earlier, how do we as humans make something like um, a laptop computer or, you know, how do we write a story or how do we um, put together a jigsaw puzzle? Well, we use our mind. And, and why does that succeed when natural processes could hmm. not succeed? Right. And I would have to say that the fact that it does succeed, that we can succeed at producing complex uh, machinery and so on, is proof that our minds are actually immaterial. Mm -hmm. Our minds are not just a bunch of atoms in a complex arrangement working purely by the laws of physics. They're not just interacting according to electromagnetic forces and so on. So, um, they, so they are doing that and they that they're interacting that. by electromagnetic forces. That's just not all that's going that's on. That's not there. all that's going on. I believe that our minds are actually, if you want to say it this way, the, the neurons in our brains are actually affected by the immaterial mind, mm -hmm. the okay. spirit of our, our beings. And um, so why can that succeed? And it's because the immaterial aspect of our mind is not dependent upon the kind of um, the guaranteed outcomes of the laws of physics, mm -hmm. which are that things will mix and randomization will take place and information loss will occur. Uh, our minds aren't affected by that. So we can... Or they're, our, not, they're not determined by that. Right, they're yeah. not, not determined. And so we can, with our minds, imagine an outcome. Like we can imagine how a puzzle should look. And we can then cause our body to take the pieces and put them together in this particular arrangement that completes the puzzle. Right. Um, Whereas just shaking the puzzle box and expecting, you know, the thousand piece puzzle to come together, that, that's one of those things that will just never happen in the mm -hmm. time frame uh, limitations of our universe. So the fact that we can do it and that we have done it, not only made puzzles, but all these other um, aspects of our technological society is actually proof that our minds have some aspect to them that is beyond the physical. Mm -hmm. And so I would agree that, that God, you know, of course, is in the same category, having an immaterial aspect that mm -hmm. he can then affect and override, if you will, the natural processes of atoms and bring together all those atoms in a way that results in a living being. Very good. Any final comments before we close? Well, just thank you for the opportunity to talk about these uh, really fascinating and important topics because to me it's important because our origin is tied to our significance mm -hmm. and um, having our origin be intentional and designed on purpose by a loving God gives us significance that goes far beyond anything that we could hope to latch on to if we were just random outcomes of the forces of nature. Well, very, very good. I appreciate thank your time you. here, Eric. And thank you. Thank you for joining us today. I want to encourage you to join our discussion in the comments below. Remember to like this video, to subscribe for more content. We release new episodes of Star Cells and God each Wednesday. They're available here on YouTube and on your favorite podcast app. Be sure to share this video with a friend. And remember, the more we know about science, the more reasons we have to believe.